Hi, this is Lex, and welcome to the FinTech Blueprint. It's your podcast about FinTech, decentralized finance, digital banking, investing, robo-advice, artificial intelligence, and all the other frontier technology that is transforming financial services. To get more content, like an illustrated transcript of this conversation in your inbox, subscribe at fintechblueprint.com. So without further delay, let's jump into today's episode. Hi, everybody, and welcome to today's conversation. I'm very excited for what we have to discuss today. We have a great guest, Paolo Arduino, who is the CTO at both Tether, the largest stablecoin in circulation, as well as Bitfinex, which is one of the largest crypto exchanges around. And we're going to dive into the history of the projects, as well as the future of the projects and the industry as well. With that, Paolo, welcome to the conversation. Thank you very much, Lex. Excited to be here. My pleasure. So obviously, enormous topics both, but I want to start with you and learn a little bit about your DNA coming into the crypto space, because you've had you know, quite a career and sort of set of experiences before that as well. How did you, you know, first engage with technology, with some of the principles in the crypto space? Like, what were your early foundational experiences? Yeah, so I've been a developer since all my life. Basically, I got my first, well, I was always excited by, you know, the ZX Spectrum and, you know, the Amiga and all the things that could put my hands on. Then when I was, I think, eight years old, my father that was working for the public electricity company, normal job, he took the leap of faith of buying the first 286, one of the first personal computers. Uh, you know, I live in a really small town outside or far away from everywhere. So he didn't have many friends. And so started looking how to, I could build my own games because by back then there were not many games on a PC and also was were quite expensive. So started code to, to uh, trying to understand how I could code things. Uh, I started to program my own games, you know, starting from, you know, first basic, then I had uh, access finally to the first C book that would teach me how to, you know, code that in C. I, I still, C is my preferred language still. It's so low level, you can do basically everything. And also I got excited with Linux, you know, I think it was pretty soon around 94. I always love like the concept of free software. I kind of an activist mind from that point of view. I'm a big fan of Lisbon Storvalds and Richard Stallman, the father of the of the new set of tools that are the ones that are making Linux available to everyone and you know surrounding the Linux kernel. You know, coded, you know, for basically up to the university, you know, kept programming a ton of different languages, kept learning different, different different languages, and also took a special course at the high school that was fully dedicated to math. I really love math as well. And then at the university, I started computing. I applied for computer science, applied to math. So that's by then, when I arrived at university, I was contributing to what at that time were called e-signs, specifically in the late Italian language, was basically a good group of geeks and nerds and hackers, all like uh, writing what we thought was cool about, about how to dis- dissect things, how to code cool things, like or uh, enter at deep levels of the operating system, discovering things, understand, you know, what's, what was behind like networking and all the, you know, young age steps of an hacker and a white hat hacker, I would say. I then at the university, I you know graduated in 2000, 2008. I was part of different research groups there. One of the main research group that I was, was asked to develop a, an application. Basically, it was an application, a networking application that was actually more like a protocol for resilient communication systems. So basically, part of my research was building this protocol that would allow communications to flow in a resilient way through battlefields across, you know, multiple paths, extremely redundant and so on. 
as a lover of uh, distributed applications already, that was clearly something that then helped me throughout my career, both in Bitfinex and Tether and uh, in the crypto space. It was also one of the most, uh, most exciting jobs I, I could ever participate to because uh, it opened really my mind on, on uh, how you can build actual things that resist to the wrath of God. That is how I refer to our Bitfinex platform because it's extremely resilient, has been resilient throughout all the craziness of, you know, 2020, 2016. Well, we had security issue, but aside that when it comes to trading solidity, whatever happens in, in the markets, we usually are the only platform that can cope with the load for, for the reason that everything is basically built on as it was a battlefield <laughs> directly also on our, on our trading application. So then as a lot of time happens, especially in Italy, you know, in the southern part of Europe, you as a developer are paid almost nothing. Developers were making around 800 euros per month. And so I started looking around. I also got into finance and always, you know, look at finance as a way to understand the world. I took the first job as a financial developer. So I my, my first role was to build a portfolio management system for a few fund managers in Switzerland was around 2008 to 2010. Then I figured out that I could that bring that knowledge to scale and being, build my uh, first startup that was called FinCluster that was taking this portfolio management system and bringing it to the cloud as a cloud solution. In parallel to that, though, I was keeping, you know, nerding around and writing software like the kernel SOX Bouncer that was like a Linux kernel module that would allow every program on your computer to start to redirect its connections towards a chain of uh, SOX files that are basically modules that allow you to remain anonymous on the internet, right? Privacy has been always one of the things that I love the most. I think it is an important human right that many people forget about. And back then, it was 2006 when I started this project. There was not even Tor around. And, you know, even Facebook was a much smaller thing than it today. So today it would be even more relevant than, than back then. But, you know, already in 2016, was I, I was hacking around privacy, building privacy solutions for that would trick all your computer applications with basically almost a turnkey solution to become private or, or like anonymize your IP address by default. You know, going back to finance, so I, so I started going towards that path and then same time, you know, for, for paying the bills, I was more and more involved in finance. I had my startup in London. We were servicing different hedge funds in, in the city, it was going pretty well. I learned basically through coding. Coding in finance is like opens the doors to everything. You have to implement calculations for every single thing from the classic stocks to, you know, bonds to options to, you know, exotic products as well, right? So I was coding all that part, but I was kind of annoyed because I could see that the entire financial, traditional financial industry was based on rubber and bands and the poorly designed system that could not talk to each other. So in 2013, when I came across the Bitcoin white paper, was actually 2012, early 2012, I came across the Bitcoin white paper. I was ex- excited about a, a blockchain first, right? I, I, I thought to Bitcoin as first as a blockchain, as a, the, the layer, the transport layer, because it would have solved many issues in traditional finance. So how people could see that have a sync node could see the very same data rather than having everyone like looking at different protocols and interacting with the perf- different protocols and potentially getting all different kinds of data and so different kinds of states. The beauty of the blockchain is that if you are fully synced, you can everyone will see the same data. So imagine in like in a banking industry or in an ecos- like a trading ecosystem, if you basically instead of having to reconcile once once a day downloading data from an, N- an FTP server from somewhere that has all like kind of errors and different formats, you could use the blockchain to rel- relate the data, right? So that would be much more efficient. So that was the first point part that caught me, and then. I started looking at Bitcoin as a peer-to-peer system that I very much loved. I've been, you know, playing with the BitTorrent technology also for for many years. And so that was one of the things that excited me. And then third, I started to understand in 2013, late 2013, Bitcoin also as a currency. So I kind of looked at Bitcoin as a a technology first rather than a, a currency. 
let me pause you there because I want to pull out a couple of things you've said. So, you know, the first thing that was interesting to me, and you said this a while earlier on, which is that as you learned to build software, you were like in the white hacker community, you were learning from a community. And I think combining that with like exposure to open source and having open source being a really big deal, right? If you're not buying Photoshop for thousands of dollars at a young age, but you want to use photo editing software or something like that, you're either learning BitTorrent really well, or you are, you know, using open software. And so for me, that's really interesting, just like the the push of creativity or like self-expression or just curiosity that comes out from engaging with open source and then doing so through community. And then the, the second bit around decentralized systems at scale, I mean, that obviously is going to play a huge role in crypto and in building an exchange and, and really behaving kind of in this adversarial way. And so as you're coming towards your realizations around Bitcoin, and many of us go through these also like banker realizations of if you could only reconcile all this stuff, it would be amazing. All these systems of spaghetti code could talk to each other. Like pausing you there, what was the role that tech played in your life? Like what did it mean for you to build things and explore things and create stuff? Like what was motivating you to do that? And how did you think of technology as a vector of human progress, or you know, is it a tool for profit seeking? Like, what did you think of it? Well, for me, the first thing that comes to my mind was something that could excel in, right? Sometimes, like, I could I could find myself really good at it from a young age. It comes really easy, and so it's a way. It became for me the way I think, right? I think things in in kind of as I, I write software, right? So I'm always looking things and from dif- many different angles and like how things could go wrong, right? So coding, if you code, if you are like coding since many years, you look at the code and you 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 think, okay, what's going, what is doing this piece of code, but also all the things that could go wrong with that piece of code on how you can, you know, all the things that you would need to do in order to make it solid or how it's all coding is like an argument, right? So you, if you express an argument, if you express an idea could be, you know, dissected in many different ways, could be attacked, could be failing in different aspects. And so for me, coding is, is truly an expression of myself, right? Something that, you know, I could bring me could allow me to dialogue in in it's like expressing french in french or or in spanish right it's like is allowing me to communicate with uh, something that is uh, tangible something that is that the other people that speak my language can understand and can can uh, and, and, and and on top of that you can you you can achieve things right you can you can build things right so with with your language for, you can express ideas but more and more with the evolution of technology, with coding, you could actually make your ideas become live. The beauty of coding is that you don't need anyone else. If you're, of course, depending on the size of the program, of the application, but to, to build small things and to deliver something to the world, to create, you can do it from your laptop, from your room. You can reach billions of people directly from your room. And that is, I think, one of the highest ways to of expressivity that humankind ever had because you know I'm not great in in in, uh, in in drawing I'm really bad I'm terrible I'm I'm not great in many things coding was the thing that for me was like a talking on, on, or or like walking and so you know it grew in me still today I do ton of things in in the, the different companies from you know working with legal you know focusing a lot on finance and and so on but when I have a few minutes I I always code I always participate to all the different projects that we have and, and give my contributing coding because it's a way to 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 play with my friends in a way like almost in a childish words childish way but I, I I see that I can still contribute at high levels because it's it it was with me since basically not when I was born, but you know when I was eight years old. Fantastic. So that takes us to you coming across Bitcoin and kind of understanding its multiple dimensions as an asset class, as a technology, as a way to have something that's a modern economic infrastructure. How does that lead you to Bitfinex? And what does Bitfinex look like when you join? That was um, late 2014. So in 2014, 
I met Giancarlo De Vasini, that was that is Bitfinex and Tether CFO, and one of his companies was a customer of my company in London, and so we start we started talking to each other, and we started alongside uh, Raphael in 2012 uh, Bitfinex, but the the landscape of exchanges back then in 2000 in 2014 was completely different from today. There were probably five exchanges five, six exchanges that were at least notable. Today we have, you know, 400, 500 exchanges. Also the exchanges that we had back then in 2013 and 14 were more like e-commerces for for Bitcoin rather than trading platforms. So we're built on uh, technologies that were exactly the ones that you would expect from a WordPress installation for building your blog or your online shop rather than, you know, a trading platform that uh, has to process orders in sub millisecond fashion. And so when Giancarlo and myself started to talk, you know, I was, Bitcoin was already in a good place, I would say. And in 2013, if I'm wrong, was the first time Bitcoin surpassed $1,000 in price. So it attracted many professional traders because of the high volatility. But the problem is that these professional traders couldn't find the professional tools that were used to in their in, in their life in the other in the theirs other life right so they were used to trading on uh, on the CME or, or interactive brokers and so on and they, they couldn't have these tools as any time there was volatility on Bitfinex but on all the other exchanges the the exchange would stop right or so their queue of orders was going in the minutes. Right, so you you were sending an order and was processed like five minutes later. That is not a great user experience. And so, basically, when we start chatting, I was tasked to to write the core part of the platform that was the machine engine. Only that for the following year and a half, I only basically focused on the on the machine engine being the thing that would make the difference between one platform and the other. So when I joined Bitfinex, I think that the exchange was able to process around the 50 order per second uh, orders per second that is kind of you know really really low number the technology was basically based on mysql as a database that mysql is kind of classic relational database that you would use for all the kind of things including again websites and similar if you start to throw in ton of inserts writes to the database it just slows down so when I when I joined, I asked, uh, I started suggesting different shift towards a different type of approach. So queues and in memory queues and disk resiliency. And so you know, with just you know, a couple of weeks of work, I could bring it to one thousand order per second, and then one month more, like five thousand, and so on. Now we are basically in the millions per second because it's is basically is multi core, is multi thread, and has like ton of a different op- optimizations. I think the the in, inner latency is uh, 50 microseconds to manage an order in a specific, specific thread, including all the different risk calculations. So, but it took like five years to get there. Can you give a sense of just how big the trading activity is, you know, in terms of users or volumes or anything that you can share that can give people a sense of the magnitude? Bitfinex, especially from 2000. 16 to 2018 to mid 2018 was the biggest exchange in terms of volume i think bitfinex was the first exchange that processed uh, had a volume of 10 billion dollars in a single day was uh, late 2017 when the entire uh, ico boom was at its peak so i remember that back then every single platform right every single platform was down and we were instead with bitfinex we were keep going right we were basically the only platform that could trade in december 2017 because there was so so new users i mean we went from i think 100,000 users to 1.5 million users in in 6 months right so it means, and it's not that easy always to scale the platform 10 times, more than 10 times in six months. Usually you would you would code something that scales twice or three times, but 10 or 15 times as we had was quite aggressive. And yet we were able to cope with the demand because, you know, the way the platform was built was fully built on top of microservices. And so we could, so everything for us, 
In our GitHub repository, we have 600, micro, uh, 600 different repositories and that each repository is basically a microservice that w- does one small thing, but it does really well. It does really fast. It's super optimized. And so we have this protocol that we built called Grenache that is like um, an internal peer-to-peer system just for Bitfinex. So I, the first thing that I coded in Bitfinex a part of Machine Engine was this microservices system that is super scalable. It's basically is built copying BitTorrent, but to build in, intranet uh, micro, microservices. And so that's basically the reason why we were able to cope with the growing demand. Today, Bitfinex is not anymore the first exchange by volume. We know, so Binance is, is the biggest by volume, you know, followed by, by Coinbase. But still, I think Bitfinex is one of the exchanges that process more orders per day. We have peaks of uh, 300 million orders in, in just six hours sometimes. So 300 million orders means that you have to record them eventually, you have to store them, you have to serve them back to the user and so on. So it's, it's, it's quite a good number compared to, <laughs> compared to the other. That's quite the machine. You know, one of the things that is tough about crypto exchanges, unlike the traditional finance sort of value chain, is that you're not just building, you know, a brokerage that routes orders to an exchange, and you're not just building a place to put your your holdings. You're building the custodian, you're building the exchange, you're building the you know the matching engine, then you're you're building distribution on top of that. You're probably connecting what people think of as sort of like savings-like activity, even you know, cash accounts or cash equivalent accounts, you end up having all of this in the same stack. How do you think about that? Like how much more difficult is the challenge in being so tightly and vertically integrated? That is definitely the the most complex thing because if you imagine like first the CME, for example, doesn't have retail customers. Internet Brokers has some retail customers, but is more still on the professional side. The thing with crypto, especially after 2017, we starting with 2017 is that it was all about retail. And so retail customers are anyway putting pressure, putting load on your other databases, on your infrastructure. They expect a Facebook-like experience with ton of resiliency, redundancy, and so on. So you have on one side the super professional customers that want the the, the millisecond latency, and uh, on the other side you are serving seeing millions of other like retail customers that instead like they keep refreshing the page, they move between pages, they you know they open ton of support tickets. In the end, they are all using the same infrastructure, the same machine engine. So you have to to prepare, to to construct, to architect your infrastructure to serve both the user types. And it's not that always that easy, right? Because, you know, the professional traders, they want the retail flow, but they don't want to be slowed down by the, the, the retails, right? So it's not a good excuse to them saying, well, but we have a ton of retailers on the platform. So that's why your order was slower today. So you have always to you know, you, you, the way you design the platforming has to be able to resist to spikes. And that is the most difficult thing because everyone wants to trade at the same moment, right? So there are, we have seen that in 2018, right? 2018, early 2019 was a really that moment for crypto. It feels like <laughs> coming like almost like in 2023 where like we are not seeing that retail excitement. But uh, nevertheless, if something happens, for example, in, remember 2020 was the 12th and 13th of March, I think, when Donald Trump announced the stop of the, uh, of, uh, the inbound flights to, into the U.S. due to COVID. The markets dropped 50%. We had exchanges that had to suspend trading. We had exchanges that or, or a platform that just went down. And Bitfinex was, was at that time did another huge volume spike and was able to keep servicing the customer. So it, we did 30x in, in terms of in the arc of an hour, we had 30x tra- traders on the platform that of course had already an account, but 30 traders that were not trading like the hour before and then started trading the uh, just, just the hour after. So the platform has always to be able to cope with this type of spikes because when something happens, everyone wants to jump in and trade that specific moment, not one hour later or two hours later, that specific moment. Yeah, it doesn't matter until it it all matters. You know, the last question I kind of want to ask on exchanges is that 
the vertical integration or like the model for that f- essentially forced vertical integration for exchanges because there wasn't giant, you know, clearing or settlement depositories, any of that in place. There, you know, there weren't brokers, everything had to be built bottoms up, created situations where it was, you know, where those businesses ended up having conflicts of interest or they were they were doing custody and lending. And over the last few years we've seen, you know, a number of these companies go down that might have had a reasonable software solution, but ended up falling apart for very human reasons. You know, obviously FTX, but even things like Voyager, right, where you wouldn't necessarily expect any sort of collapse, but ended up getting pressured. What's your just industry or product view on what exchanges did wrong and then what they should look like in the future? Like we as an industry definitely have to come away from that experience and figure out better structure. How do you think about what could have been done differently? And then maybe like, what are you thinking about for the strategic future of exchanges and whatever you can share about Bitfinex? This is a really interesting point because in 2019, well, I I mean, I have a a long background in uh, coding and building applications for traditional finance. I always thought that these commingled functions would come to an end. So in 2019, with Bitfinex, we we started supporting external custody with things like copper or fireblocks and so on. So to allow the traders to to give the opportunity to allocate a portion of uh, of their assets to you as an exchange, but also being protected in case of banks bankruptcy, right? So sometimes when we have seen in the past exchanges that uh, went down. They, you know, they they were used like banks from their customers or f- from their traders. So if you are in a situation where you are leaving on the exchange only the portion of the funds that you need for for trading that specific moment, then I think is a much better, more solid experience. It's more aligned with the traditional finance. So definitely conflict of interests can arise if there is full control over the assets from one single entity. I think today there are plenty of other external custodians like I think Zodia and and, and again like Copper is doing a fine job and others uh, that offer this function to professional traders. Also for market maker, market makers is quite good because you know they can allocate, you know, they can quickly move if let's say that both exchanges are are using copper or any other external custody solution you could be in a situation as a trader where you can quickly move assets or allocate assets from one exchange to another with a click of a button with with just an internal settlement still maintaining the custody on the external custodian and so and, and then of course the exchanges would have a periodic settlement let's say every hour or so or after a certain threshold maybe every 100k of uh, of of, uh, of threshold they could trigger a settlement and rebalance the assets directly with the custodian. So there are many things that, or many hybrid solutions that I think the industry is, is ready to embrace to avoid the things that happened in 2022 will will happen again. Because I think, you know, now, of course, everyone says, well, you know, it uh, was obvious that, that the, how, what happened and why it happened and so on. But we should not forget about it because eventually we will fall or we as in, in the industry will fall again in the same temptation, the same issues, if basically there is not enough push from customers in looking for segregated custody solutions. I think that's a really interesting point. These dangers or like these mistakes, they are repeatable patterns. Like financial crises look very similar in terms of what causes them and what kind of behavior causes them. And then Individual culpability also looks really similar in, you know, in different time periods. And I think there are lessons about the segregation of funds, the segregation of businesses that will get adopted in the crypto industry. And we're still kind of slowly, slowly chewing through those. I want to switch to Tether because Tether is so important to the ecosystem. And it's also a really meaningful invention for the crypto ecosystem. I mean, if we rewind back to Bitcoin, one of the pushbacks against Bitcoin was, I can't buy sandwiches with this since it's so volatile, you know, like the famous pizza that that was worth something like $12 million. And so can you talk about how Tether was 
built in the beginning? Like, what was the very first architecture for it? And what was it for? Who wanted it? And for whom was that initial version of it built? So going back to 2014, the industry was was collecting some new traders that were professional traders. The one of the reasons was volatility. The other one was the issue of spreads across different exchanges, right? So we had at some point when Bitcoin broke $1,000, we were in a situation where on some exchanges, the price of Bitcoin was $1,000. On the others were one point, was 1.2,000. The concept that uh, everyone familiar with traditional finance would think about is arbitrage, right? Cross-exchange arbitrage. So the arbitrageurs are traders that buy... Bitcoin on the exchange where the price is lower, maybe it was $1,000, and move these Bitcoins on the exchange where the price is higher, like 1.2, and sell it there for cash, then take the cash, move the cash on the exchange where the price is lower, and do it in loop, right? And this pressure, this is basically pressure on the market, would bring the two exchanges aligned. Because if you put buying pressure on the exchange where the price is higher, uh, sorry, lower, and you put sell pressure on, on the exchange where the price is higher, then you are going to bring the two exchanges aligned. But the thing is that you couldn't do this, this arbitrage because in order to do that, you would need to send wires around. And wires were taking three days, one day, seven days, who knows. So the arbitrage opportunity was long gone when the money was hitting the, ac- the account. And so really the Bitfinex group that was running exchange, Giancarlo in specific, thought about, you know, a solution that if you think about it is a really, really simple solution. Why we don't reuse the brilliant technology that was created with Bitcoin, so the blockchain, but instead of running Bitcoin, you put a dollar on top of it. The dollar was the is the, the reserve currency of the world, is the one the thing that everyone wants. So, I mean, the idea is really simple, but Ethereum was not there. And we look at around the first, the only solution to issue a token with a fixed value was a product called OmniLayer that was color coin on top of Bitcoin, was still using the Bitcoin blockchain, but appending some and keeping some metadata to express a different token, a different product compared to Bitcoin. And uh, that was really cool. In fact, with Tether, you could, instead of waiting days to get your wire hitting the other exchange, you're, you, you could just have, you had just to wait 10 minutes, so the Bitcoin block time, to get you know, your dollars on the other side. Of course, that needed all the exchanges to adopt, to adopt Tether. And at the beginning, it was not that trivial. I mean, you know, we, we tried to explain, and you would think that you know, other exchange owners would understand Tether and the importance of, of the solution. But actually, it took two years from 2014 to 2016 to see the first exchange that by its own, you know, looked at Tether and decided to list it. And then started to, that was Poloniex, and started to list it across, you know, all, all the different pairs that they had where it had also Tether pair, a USDT pair. Then I think Bitrex added it in early 2017 and Bitfinex had it. And basically in 2017, there was a, was the, with, with the incoming new user base, we gave the opportunity to professional traders to arbitrage all the different tokens across the different trading exchanges. Imagine 2017 without Tether. So you, there were Binance starting in 2017, right? So you had Binance, Bitrex, Poloniex, Bitfinex, and with uh, tens of new tokens every week and no way to arbitrage them across them. That would have been a mess, right? So there was no price reference, like, you know, and in order to arbitrage them, you would have sent, needed to send to, to send wires all, all around for and waiting an immense amount of time and so on. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's if you look at any traditional brokerage, there's a cash sweep, right? There's some sort of cash account that is in that brokerage and you send money into the, those rails and then you have a native way of exchanging in that brokerage. The use case absolutely makes sense. You want the dollar in the software stack in which you are trading. You don't want it in the banking system. 
how did the on-ramp work? Like, how would somebody get Tether? Did they wire you assets? Like, what was the what was the on-ramp? Because, that, you know, that's a place that's been sort of fixed over time, but I'm sure in the early days it was quite difficult. The approach was basically, has been remaining the same. Of course, more banking partners now, much more, you know, solid operations and so on. But the, the concept is you send us, you know, $100,000 via wire um, to one of the banks that we support, and we issue 100,000 USDT. Of course, minus we take 10 basis points in, uh, in uh, fees for issuance, both issuance and redemption. Let's say then someone wants to redeem, they come to us. So on, on the platform that is called, there is a website called Tether.io. They register, of course, both for issuances and redemptions. You have to be registered. You have to do Tor, KYC, and ML. And then you send us back, or you know, one customer send us, you know, one hundred thousand USDT to our treasury wallet, and we will send back via wire the money. So the process is is, is fairly simple over the course of of the years. Uh, of course, we we enlarge, we increase, we made the banking uh, our banking relationship much more solid. That is what what we are seeing today, right? So we have that's how we can manage around eighty three billion. Well, more than eighty three billion now is around eighty six, given you know the the entire also the, with the, including the excess reserves, we we can manage a, around eighty six billion of assets as of today. I have to ask around about like the banking system, especially in the context of what's happened with USDC, you know, and like the Silicon Valley Bank collapse, you know, Signature, Silvergate, all the banks that are the holders of the collateral. People don't realize that you could have kind of tokenized deposit risk because you're like, well, that's the safest thing that there is, right? An American bank holding the U.S. dollar. But actually, there's institutional counterparty risk there as well. And insurance goes only so far. How do you think about that banking counterparty risk? Like, how have you selected your bank counterparts? What are the criteria that you use? And then how do you try to diversify so that you're minimizing that counterparty risk? Yeah, I think the, especially in 2023, we have seen these collapses. There is um, a topic that is part of the, edu- the ongoing education that have to be done with the user base, right? So if you think about the stable coin, the first thing, first thing that you would think about is, well, of course, it, you have to keep cash in a bank, but Try to go in a bank, to a bank, right, and, and ask them, well, can I keep $5 billion in pure cash in your bank? They will say, of course, no, because, I mean, as, as pure cash, they will not allow it because that it will go on on, uh, on their balance sheet that they need to, to keep ton of reserves of their own money and so on. And also that cash is not insured. Like in the US, it will be insured up to $250,000 from the FDIC. So... The, you cannot keep pure cash in a bank. You need to, that cash has to be put in something. And that something you would imagine, and, and especially today is the standard, would be U.S. Treasury bills. Short maturity and also these U.S. Treasury bills are considered a security. So with a cash, let's say that even if you try to keep cash, ton of cash on, on the bank balance sheet, if the bank goes bankrupt, that cash will be dragged into the bankruptcy because the cash is, uh, again, is on the balance sheet. And so there is not much way around that. That's why exist, the FDIC exists. But with the securities, they are na- nominal to your account. So you have, you own the, the direct, so they have, they are assigned to you, for example, for the T-bills, you have your Q-zips and so on. So you can always, so if in case of bankruptcy of a bank, you will get them back, right? So you, of course, might take a little bit, a little while, but they will be transferred back to you. You can claim direct ownership on those things. And so that is the realization. That is what Tether actually did late last year and early this year before, you know, all the craziness started of, of these banks to reduce the, the pure cash portion 
and use instruments like UST bills, but also the overnight reverse repos, fully collateralizing in ceiling UST bills to have the certainty of having the highest liquidity, like we are talking about, I think at this stage, $10 billion in overnight reverse repos, but at the same time, have the certainty that whatever happens, you can get your money back. And so, of course, the selection of the banks is extremely important because you want to, you can you cannot have black banks that are blowing up. I mean, I think so far the tether banks have been fairly fairly solid and being battle tested a lot. I want to remind everyone that in 2022 was May, tether was able to redeem seven billion dollars in 48 hours. That was 10 percent of our reserves back then, and 20 billion dollars in 20 days. That was 25 percent of our reserves, right? So. Also, our banks have been heavily battle tested. You know, it was a period where everyone was questioning if Tether had, in fact, the money. And we, with, I think, what that moment, 2022, was the best moment. It was the most stressful, but best moment of Tether when you know we could prove the solid our solidity to the solidity of our banks and so on. Not everyone had the money, right? <laughs> so, by contrast, having the money was pretty good. Yeah, exactly. I mean, that's that. In fact, I mean, was trial by fire, and so you know, people said, "Well, but aren't you upset that we lost? You lost twenty five billion. Well, it's not our money, right? It's, it's someone else's money, and we were custodying. It. Of course, we were making a good interest out of it. But in the end, our only job is to give money back to to customers that want to redeem. Now, I think the the most important thing is to you know when. Especially if you have users, users might not have the full context of, you know, what are the risks of banks and why, you know, the classic question, as I said before, is always why don't keep everything full in pure cash? Well, you can, again, you cannot do that. There are many reasons and it's extremely risky. The only way to mitigate the risk is short maturity USD bills low, below 90 days, overnight reverse, overnight reverse repos. That's, that's the, the, I think, the best solution so far. And I think that in general, all the different, all the biggest stable coins so far in the market are pretty much using the same technique to avoid other issues like, you know, the SVB dragging down one stable coin. That gets you pretty heavily into the capital markets, you know, and I think one of kind of my understandings of the space was that the stable coin is actually one of the largest product market fits or like one of the largest uses is for market makers and arbitrageurs to be able to do what you said across different exchanges. So like the institutional demand is the primary demand and the retail demand kind of is secondary. So does that make sense? Like is kind of the the primary customer of the stable coin, you know, a market maker or an algo trading firm, or is it, you know, kind of retail onboarding one by one? It is right or was right. So in a sense that when Tether started and up to until I think 2020, yeah, 2020, we we have seen basically institutionals, market makers, OTC desk and so on buying USDT to trade actively on the markets. But something happened. COVID happened, huge inflation, countries like Turkey, you know, Venezuela, Argentina, and you name you name it have started to be much more affected than many others globally and from inflation. I mean, at some point, I think Turkish lira lost 80% compared to the previous year against against uh, the dollar. Let's not talk about the Argentina pesos because that is probably even worse. And so all these, all these people, right, that were not and are not direct customers of Tether, have been onboarded on uh, on exchanges or local exchanges, global exchanges, and has started to look at alternatives, not to speculate on the crypto markets, but to hold their wealth, right? To keep their wealth. And so suddenly, so they 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 started to trust Tether more than anything else, and so started to buy Tether against all the other fiat currencies on every possible exchange in this world. And so if we think about you know the market dynamics, what happens there is that you have the buy pressure of USDT on secondary markets because these you know exchanges would be secondary markets to Tether will bring the price of Tether a few basis points above the dollar, and so that triggers still the same market makers 
the OTC desks and so on, to purchase Tether, but not for trading for themselves or for on behalf of their institutional customers, but to provide it as a liquidity to the markets to just provide it as liquidity to the markets because you know they can cash in like maybe five basis points, 10 basis points for, for and that is, you know, good, easy money for them because they, they there is basically, it's, it's kind of risk-free trade, right? So you buy something that's worth one, you you sell it for, for something that is worth 10 basis points above one, and that's it. And so it's it's something that I think is, has uh, helped the market cap of, of Tether growing a lot in um, since 2020. You could see from the charts, right? From 2020, the the, the boom is is enormous. But also, if you go in the streets of in, in Buenos Aires or, or in Georgia, in uh, Georgia, in the um, in uh, in in Europe, right? So every 50 meters, you go into Belize in Georgia. Every 50 meters, meters, you have a Bitcoin sign and a Tether sign, a USDT, like the, the Tether's logo. The first time I went there was like one month ago. And so th- these people are not, you know, they, they are just looking at as ways as, as, as uh, to ways to protect themselves, their family wealth. They don't want, they are not looking to enrich themselves to speculate on Shiba Inu or whatever. They just want, you know, some tool to avoid to be, to, to go bankrupt because of their, the, you know, the, their huge inflation in their country. And so I, I think basically over, over the years now is, is shifting more and more to that and trade finance. So basically international, you know, purchase of goods like cotton and, uh, you know, all these uh, primary matters and so on. That's what we are seeing. I have so many more questions to ask you, so maybe we'll do um, a part two in the future. But for today, we're out of time. If you want our listeners to learn more about you, about Bitfinex or Tether, where should they go? So I'm Paolo at Paolo Arduino on Twitter. They can look also at Bitfinex on Twitter or at and or at Tether underscore TO on Twitter. I'm the guy that posts memes and not always serious stuff and you know sometimes runs about the tether truthers but you know, <laughs> i think it's important for the truth to shine certainly twitter or x is the best place for that right it's definitely entertaining i mean and i'm i, I should say i cannot believe it's free but i'm buying this eight dollar per month thing so it's not necessarily free anymore <laughs> yeah blue checks for all of us Paolo, thank you so much for joining us today. Hopefully, we'll follow up more in the future. Thank you very much, Lex. Have a great day. Hi, everyone. That's it for this week's episode of the Fintech Blueprint. For more technical deep dives into all things fintech and decentralized finance, check out fintechblueprint.com and grab a free subscription to the newsletter. This is Lex, and I'll see you next time. <music>